Hello, we're now going to talk about uh, the first of our design objectives, um, in particular how to remove the effect or minimize the effect of load disturbances on the behavior of our process. Um, so just to remind ourselves sort of the, of the general framework here, we're investigating uh, this feedback loop um, in which P is the process that we're interested in controlling. And this signal here, um, Y, the output of our process, this is the thing that we wish to control. And we're talking about uh, load disturbances today. So what do we want to do? We want to minimize the effect of a load disturbance D on Y. So we want um, the effect of D to not really be seen in the output uh, Y. And how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to do this through the design of our uh, controller or compensator C. Um, so that's what we're trying to do or trying to understand. And uh, the way we're going to, or the sort of the, the rule to emerge about uh, at the end of all of this is the secret to removing load disturbances is high gain in uh, the, the controller C of S. And what does that mean? Well, very simply, you just need, this just means that the size of C of j omega should be big, much bigger than one, uh, say. And for what values of omega? Well, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, so typically you want it to, this to be large in the frequency uh, ranges where you expect your disturbances to um, be largest. So the sort of disturbances we're talking about here, they tend to be quite slow acting, so um, or quite consistent. So imagine like wind buffeting a car or something. It's not changing extremely fast. It's kind of like a constant battering in a sort of predictable direction. Um, or I mean, you, you don't have. It doesn't have to necessarily be external um, signals captured by this signal D. It could also be a, capturing the effect of um, slow uh, slow changes to the process as well. So maybe this D, this is corresponding to the con consumption of fuel in our aircraft. So D will just be like a slowly ramping up signal. So the, the effect of the loss of mass becomes more and more pronounced as time goes on and on and on. So this is not guaranteed, uh, but D is typically like steps slash slow signals. Um, and what this means uh, typically is that this we want the gain of our controller to be large at low frequencies. So slowly varying things in the time domain correspond to low frequencies. And it's important to try to build up your sort of duality of thinking between the time and the frequency domain. Um, a very helpful uh, example to sort of illustrate this slow changing low frequency connection um, is to think just about the step function. So the step function is a function that looks something like this. Um, so it starts off at zero and then it goes to one and then it's constant and here we've got time. And over here in the frequency domain, so if I call this h of t and I just look at the magnitude of h of j omega, uh, so here we've got uh, omega and we're just plotting the size of the Laplace transform of h as a function of frequency, well, the Laplace transform of a step is 1 over s. The size of 1 over s at different frequencies is just 1 over omega. And so if this is a logarithmic scale, as it typically would be, and this is also a logarithmic scale, the magnitude just looks like um, a line with a negative slope. And as you can see, this has got far higher gains at low frequencies. Um, you might think, oh, OK, yeah. Maybe the step is it's kind of slowly changing for all of this, but I mean it's extremely it changes extremely fast here. Um, a ramp that's something that's much uh, much more slowly changing. So a ramp uh, this pen doesn't work very well. A ramp looks like this, 
And so let's call it the let's call this signal say I don't know g of t. And the Laplace transform of the ramp is one of s squared. So we get exactly the same thing, but now with double the slope. And so you can see this has got even more of its um, gain in uh, low frequency ranges. So um, typically d will be slow varying things, and this corresponds to low frequency behaviors. And so we want large gains in our controller at low frequencies. Um, of course, in your particular application, if your disturbances are very uh, fast acting, you need to to rethink this picture, of course. Um, but the the kind of the concepts we're learning can be adapted. Um, so this is the solution, and well, this is the intu the intuition behind the solution. Let's just sort of try to dig into this in a little bit more detail. Um, so what are we actually trying to do? So we're trying to reduce the effect of the disturbance on the output y. And so what transfer function do we need to look at? We want to look at how d affects y. And now we know the closed loop transfer function from our rule. We get that one just by putting the thing that's in between the two. So p. And then, so that goes in the numerator. In the denominator, we have 1 plus the loop gain, which in this case is p times c. So pc. So we know our output is given by this transfer function here multiplied by the disturbance signal d. And maybe you can already start to see the intuition here. If we make c very, very large, this guy is going to become small. Um, let's just sort of refine this a little bit. And let's write this as p multiplied by 1 over 1 plus pc multiplied by d. Because uh, th this more clearly effect, uh, illustrates the effect of feedback. So this is the, the thing we mentioned on, last time. This is the sensitivity function, also called s. Um, so the sensitivity function, so the, tr the transfer function 1 over 1 plus pc. And if you like, the sensitivity function is comparing open and closed loop. So in the absence of feedback, the effect on the disturbance, or the effect of the disturbance on the output, would just be given by p times the disturbance. When we close the loop, um, we mul we scale the whole thing by one plus p c, and and th this is why this one this sensitivity function is so central to all of control. Because if, if you actually think of all of the transfer functions that we had before, the sensitivity function is comparing open to closed loop. And so the size of the sensitivity function is telling you the effect of uh, your feedback. Um, and in particular, we see here that if we want to reduce the effect of disturbances d on the output y, we need our sensitivity function to be very, very small. Um, and so we need it to be small in the frequency uh, ranges where our disturbances typically act. If we want to try and build up a more graphical picture of this or try to understand it in terms of um, the loop gain or open loop properties. So this thing, p multiplied by c, this transfer function is typically called the loop gain. And this was the central object in the Nyquist stability criterion. So let's try to understand um, these objectives from uh, the perspective of the Nyquist plot, because it will help build our intuition um, into how to design uh, the controller C. So what is the Nyquist plot? Well, we take a copy of the complex plane. You know, we know the minus one point is important. Um, and then what we do is we draw um, a locus on here, and this is L of j omega. And what this means is that we take different values of omega, we substitute j omega in for s, we compute this complex number, and it gives us a point in the complex plane. So complex number in, complex number out. And so each point on this curve corresponds to different values of omega. And it, that's what this arrow is indicating. It's indicating the direction of increasing omega and here we have omega is infinity, and omega zero is somewhere off the picture here. So um, this is L. 
what is this distance here? So as a complex number, this distance here, this is just L of j omega for the particular value of omega that this point on the curve corresponds to. So that's L. And what's this distance here? Well, that's 1 plus L. 1 plus L. So this distance here is 1 plus L. So what's uh, interesting about that? Well, you see, 1 plus L is precisely the denominator of this thing here. So you, the distance of points on your Nyquist plot to the minus 1 point gives you 1 over the value of the sensitivity. And in particular, you can see now that if we get very, very close to the minus 1 point, then this distance here gets very, very short, which means the sensitivity function gets very, very large. So now you can sort of, you see even more significance to the minus one point. I and mean, before we were just talking about minus one had this role in counting encirclements to deduce stability or not. But now you see that actually the distance or how close you are to minus one governs the size of the sensitivity function. And the sens size of the sensitivity function is telling you what the effect of your feedback is. Um, and we can even sort of enhance this picture by drawing on, like if I draw on the unit circle, um, so this distance here is 1. So if I draw a circle of radius 1 centered on the point minus 1, well, this is, like, if you like, this is the contour of sensitivity function equal to 1. Whenever your Nyquist plot or the, for the frequencies that your Nyquist plot is inside this circle, your sensitivity function will be larger than 1. And for all uh, frequencies where it's outside um, of this circle, it will be less than 1. And here we see when the size of the sensitivity function is less than 1, our feedback has the effect of reducing the effect of a disturbance compared to open loop, but the converse is true um, when we're inside this circle. And yeah, there's just more trade-offs now because process, a process transfer function will typically go to the origin. There are going to be frequency ranges where your sensitivity function gets bigger than one, and we're going to really get onto this uh, later. Uh, but the power of feedback is it, it lets you control which frequency ranges that happens in, and maybe you can match those so that you can make sure that the sensitivity function is small in the frequency ranges where your disturbance is are large. Um, and of course we could draw on other circles. So this is the circle of uh, radius 1. You could draw on many, many other circles. So like point 0.1 would be something around here. I mean, good control system design, um, we, we would want to avoid the, say, the size of the sensitivity function equals 2 circle will look something like this. And we should never enter into that circle because we'll get um, even if our disturbance is small if we start having very high gains in our sensitivity we'll see uh, a bad response um, so it's sort of good uh, good practice to avoid uh, the sensitivity function of size 2 and you can now also see why high gain in your controller at the frequency ranges of interest will do the desired job if the size of uh, C is large, then L will just lie, the size of L will also be large, and we won't lie inside these um, sort of critical circles, if you like. Um, so there we have a very brief introduction to the lo load disturbance um, problem and what it's got to do with sensitivity function and sort of how you would go about trying to satisfy this kind of objective. Of course, you shouldn't just look at the effect of um, disturbances on y. Uh, another important consideration would be checking the effect of your disturbances on your control input u. Um, so we'd also be interested in that. For example, if the gain from d to u is very large, what that would mean is that a small disturbance would require a very large control effort to deal with it. Um, so, yeah, this is just part of the story, so you need to also check um, u, and in this case it's going to be minus 
PC over 1 plus PC D. And we can't make, this can't be that large either, otherwise we would need enormous control efforts to regulate the disturbances D. And um, yeah, I just want to reinforce the, the, the point here that it, you really have to look at all of the, the transfer functions. I mean, we've already seen these three popping up in just the load disturbance um, problem, and we're going to see more of them um, in all of the other objectives as well. Um, so yeah, there we go.